I'd like to thank my patrons for making this video possible. Let me give special thanks to Cooper's Creatures, whose creatures are indeed quite Coopery, and to Robert Harris, who is not just an excellent Robert, but also a good friend. We're going to have a little discussion about motivation today, but before we get into that, I want to remind everyone that the Proco Challenge for February is running right now, and I will be judging it with my good friend Ahmed al -Duri. The prompt is First Contact. Uh, the moment where humans will first encounter another intelligent species, interpret however you will, and submit a piece of art using the hashtag ProcoChallenge before, let me look here, February 14th at midnight PST. So anything goes, you could do 2D, 3D, um, vignette, full color, drawing, sketch, whatever you want to do, first contact, send your art, the 14th before midnight, and Ahmed and I will look through them, check them out, uh, laugh, cry, experience, cosmic awe, everything that's on the table with a topic like that. Um, but we're very open. Whatever your interpretation is, we'll be happy to see it. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing some of your work. This piece that is playing right now is a little promo image that I did for the challenge. Uh, it's called Inward Contact, and it's playing with a bunch of ideas. Um, is it Inward Contact or Inner Contact? I don't know. I named my pieces on the lark, so I forget really quick. But it's playing with a lot of the um, sort of zeitgeisty thoughts that are out there in the world right now about communication with other entities or intelligences in altered states of consciousness. So this piece is just a, a little homage to some of those ideas, not handled in the, it's a little tongue in cheek with how on the nose it is, but I thought that would work for a promo image. But yeah, that's what was on my mind while I was making that. And don't take that as any kind of cue that we are looking for anything similar for the contest. It's just what I wanted to do. Okay, onward to motivation. I was having a conversation with my wife the other night and it got me thinking about materialism and motivation, but not so much in the sense of how we're motivated to buy things and get the status we want to achieve in society, but the more insidious part of materialism and how it affects our art, particularly how hard it is to pin down the spot, the exact spot where our materialistic drives intersect with our life and our art practice. Let's see if we can produce the problem with a, a little question and answer. So brace yourself for one of those buzzkill, end of the party type questions. If I ask you, where does your joy come from in life? What do you say? Take a second to answer the question as seriously as you can. So, you know, take an annoyed breath and align with your deepest values and your most core being and see what comes up as the answer. I think a lot of us are inclined to provide a very similar answer, actually. Family, friends, loved ones. Intimate moments spent with partners, kids, and pets, sometimes in amazing places, but often not. The unabashed joy of time spent in creative pursuits or consumption of beautiful art. Great. No materialism here, right? Uh, well, I, I actually think that's part of the problem. We're all very quick to claim these things are the source of our joy when we conceptualize it, when we're faced with the question at its most brash. But the tricky part is, beyond our lip service, how much time do we actually spend living like that's the truth? How often are we driven, motivated, and making decisions based on those things that we all readily claim are our source of joy? I'll speak from experience here briefly. Uh, I could win a competition where silver-tongued oversharers preach anodyne musings on the most enlightened things from which to derive joy. Things like the free gift of consciousness, the miracle of casual care between longtime lovers, the interspecies camaraderie possible between person and pet. I could go on and do. But if you look at my life, 
how many of my day-to-day -day decisions seem motivated by these beliefs? Few, I would say, unfortunately. I still fearfully pack my schedule with every job that comes by because I worry about getting more money and I worry about what to do with the money I have. I fret my career from every angle, where it's going, even though I can't control it, where it's been, even though that's in the past, and what I can do to exercise the little agency that I have over it, even though my vision is short and my information hysterically limited. These types of worries, I have to admit, get the lion's share of my pool of energy. And even though I do get great joy from those classic humble sources of well-being, if I'm honest with myself, not even 5% of my energy is spent being lost in egoless communion with my dog. Now, it may sound like I'm making a value claim here. I get that. It's inevitable from the language. But uh, I'm trying not to. I don't think I am. I'm, I'm personally of the belief that if you spend 90% of your time narcissistically suffering over your career, it's because you secretly like it. Just not the part of you that you identify with. Even if your experience of it is undifferentiated pain and self-loathing the whole time, there is some part of you that finds it perversely fascinating to think about constantly. So to some extent, you like it. So good for you. What I'm pointing out here is the painful disjunction between what we will all readily say is the source of our joy and what is implicitly the source of our joy when we look at the way we worry and fret our way through life. When I look at that subtle, insidious asymmetry, it reveals to me that even though I live below my means, even though I don't buy much, even though I don't spend much time coveting material wealth or goods or preening over the ones that I have, I am still really fucking materialistic. I'm materialistic down to my bones. What I would say is the source of my joy, family, friends, etc., would indicate that I already have enough in my life, and certainly more than I would need to occupy my joyful attention for the foreseeable future, but I don't live like I have enough. I live like I must thrash and scratch and pull my life together every second of the day. This mindset of better gigs, better art, more successful career, more people liking my work, it's reinforced every time I fretfully pack my work schedule, even though I'm exhausted, even though I've barely talked to anyone in weeks because I'm working till 10. It is reinforced every time I think about what the drawing I'm doing means to me or others or to the arc of my art practice, rather than focusing just on the content of the drawing and what it is asking for as an individual piece. Again, I'm not leaning away from this because this viewpoint is bad on some imagined moral spectrum. I'm leaning away because it's silly. I mean, maybe even stupid. It's a series of unchosen, thoughtless reactions executed habitually by someone who, if asked at a party, would say they live for everything in life besides those things. And that's just stupid. It's stupid to live so backwards to my values. So what the hell am I doing? Well, I'm getting by, that's for sure, like everybody else. And I'm trying bit by bit to get better about all of it. It's not easy. Many of the points that need addressing, you know, like not working to the breaking point of your will and body, for example, are conditioned by by the reality of the cultural fabric around us and require a sort of sophisticated secession from the down-to-earth norms that comfort us. I find that part especially difficult. Now, a lot of people from my family or around me are blue collar and saying you're taking a day off of your art job to rest because you see the wisdom in listening to your tired body comes off so painfully a feat that the withering stare it produces feels 
utterly deserved every time, every time. So I'm on this journey. Uh, I'm sure some of you are, and I'm trying to be less silly and live more by what I know brings me joy, what I really think brings me joy, and stop letting there be this strange misalignment between my life and what I believe makes me happy. So I'm trying to let my love of drawing and creating drive my thoughts and decisions about art a little more instead of taking them for granted and letting negativity be the driving force behind my motivations. And that's really what it comes down to. Motivation gets tossed around as a word a lot in the art community. And it gets tossed around as one net good all the time. It's always good if you're motivated. It all comes down to putting in a certain number of hours, practicing so much, getting good, so motivation is always good. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I think there are wise motivations and there are unwise motivations. And I think every time that you let a wise motivation, like peaceful joy, love for creating, anything along those lines, every time you let a wise motivation like that make you sit down at the drawing table, that reinforces a sustainable, positive habit that will be healthy for you and that will feed back positively into your life. And on the other hand, every time you let an unwise motivation like jealousy, rivalry, desire for things that you and no one else can control, like money, status, appreciation from others. Every time you let one of those unwise motivations make you sit down at the drawing table, even if it makes you draw fiercely, ferociously, with vigor, well, it did that. But it's also building the habit of letting negativity be your driving force, of letting unwise, unchosen things being what spurs your decisions. And when you're letting it spur decisions like sitting down at the drawing table, something that you really care about, something that is probably highly emotionally charged for you as an artist, now you're playing with fire, now you're riding the razor's edge. If you're doing that without wisdom, if you're not choosing that carefully, you really don't know what that's going to do to you and the practice. And you can be in those loops for years. And a lot of people are. I think we've all seen them. We've all been them at some point. I would say bank your spirit and bank your motivations on wise things. Try to look for positive aspects of your life and your practice that you can focus on and give them the attention that we tend to not provide them and let them make you go to the drawing table. All right. I think I've made my point. Thank you for drawing today.